people here. That's good, that's good. Uh, I usually ask that question. Last year, it was around between 15 and 20 percent, depending on the conference or the, the people I was talking to. So it is growing. It's, it, it, this is catching on. It is moving forward in terms of, of cloud services. So we're going to be talking about Office 365 in education today, um, which is Microsoft's uh, offering to colleges, universities, and schools. Um, and also, I, th I thought I'd, I'd share with you our, um, our cloud strategy. So why, why is Microsoft in cloud? Why is Microsoft in cloud? And if you think about it, several years ago, five, ten years ago, who are our key competitors? Who would you say are our key competitors? It's, it was IBM, it was Oracle, it was other software vendors, it was Nafel of old. Um, but recently, it's, it's Google. And it's Amazon, and it's Apple, and Amazon, Amazon, they sell books, don't they? So these are our key competitors. And then, so therefore, we've had to change our business model completely. And so start to look at um, advancing in the cloud. But we're not new to this game. And I'll, sh I'll show you that a little bit later in terms of the services that we do have and we have had running for a long time in the cloud, in the cloud environment. So, so just a quick question and throw out some, what is the cloud? If somebody said to you, and as, as I've had, I was at the Bet Show this year, and I had a, a few teachers come to me and say, well, what's, what's this cloud? Where is our information? Is it just up there somewhere? So if somebody said that to you, what is the cloud? How would you describe that? Just throw out. You didn't think I was going to ask you questions, did you? You thought I was just going to do it all by myself. What's the cloud? A collection of servers. A collection of servers. Right, OK, good response. Yeah, good collection of servers. Yeah, Any, anything else? You've all, you're all coffeeed up and just wanted to relax, don't you? So it's interesting. So what, why is the cloud called the cloud? See, I'm picking on you now, aren't I? <laughs> it's because you've responded once, I'm picking on you. It's difficult to define its location. Difficult to define its location. That, that's, a, that's, that's a good response. And in the early days of networking, when you could link PCs together, Oh, yes, we we're talking cutting edge technology back in the mid 80s when you could link PCs together. I used to sell networks into bookshops. And we used to go into bookshops and speak to the senior people in bookshops and say, look, we can link your PCs together. And at the end of the day, we can send an order off to your supplier via a modem, a 1200K modem. Oh, this was cutting edge technology. And so when we used to draw that out, we draw a straight line between the PCs. And then we draw a zigzag line, and then a cloud. And that represented the BT phones system. And so that's how it caught on. So the, the cloud became the internet. And the internet then became the services on the internet. And so now it's become a, a commercial term of, of services on the internet. So as you quite rightly said, this poor lady who teacher who came to me, it, it doesn't, all the information is just not out there somewhere. It's running on somebody's computer somewhere. It's in data centers somewhere. So if you're using Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you, Hotmail, Google, I don't know if I can say that word, um, whatever services there are, they're all running on somebody's data center somewhere. And, and this was kind of enlightening to this, to this lady. So from our point of view, the strategy is this, that we have millions of customers, literally millions of customers, using our stuff in their organizations, in their schools and colleges and universities. Uh, and they are quite happy to do so and to continue doing so. Um, however, now we've got this cloud stuff around, our, our idea is, well, let's mix them together. Let's provide a hybrid strategy so that if people want to start dabbling in the cloud, starting to put storage out there, uh, starting to want to put some of the, the more mundane stuff out there, then it will help them to do that. And we'll make it look as though it's part of their own environment. So it's a hybrid strategy we have. It's mixing what's on-premise with what's off-premise, because most of our customers aren't quite ready to move everything into the cloud yet. Got some advanced schools who are saying, yeah, we want to push everything into the cloud. You just calm down, and let's, move, let's, let's take little steps, and let's move out there and start taking advantage where we can. So why cloud? Why use it? I've asked you too many questions now over here. Let's try over here. How, why use cloud? What's the reasons for using cloud? Bigger storage capacity. So yes, I've got more capacity in the cloud than I have on premise. And they say that the cloud is a great equalizer. So if I want to spin up 10 terabytes of data 
Uh, now I could do so, and I could do that within 10 minutes. Uh, if I wanted to spin up a thousand machines, I could do so uh, and gain access to it. I can grow my organization um, with the cloud. The cloud stretches and grows with me. I don't have to think about, well, I've got to, before I can do this exciting project that a, a lecturer or a teacher wants, I've got to think about, oh, I've got to think about getting capacity for that and ordering the kit and then building it and making space for it and cooling it and so on and so on. Uh, working with a school recently where they had 54 file servers and they were running out of space in the network room and they're sharing the, sh the caretaker's room for computers. Bottles of bleach on top of machines, brushes leaning against the computer. Okay, it's not as bad as that. But you get the idea that people are running out of space, so more capacity. So yes, good response. Any others? Why the cloud? Why use it? Carbon footprint, okay, offset the carbon footprint. And so that's an interesting one. That's a really good response. So these data centers that are all running these cloud services are massive. They buy on huge scales of economy. Uh, and they employ the latest in technology in terms of cooling systems, uh, using efficient electricity, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an offset of your green, uh, the carbon footprint, uh, into the data centers, and the data centers are running much more efficiently than typically spread out computers all over the place. So that's a really good response. And in fact, we had one colleague save 12,000 pounds a year just in electricity alone by moving stuff into the cloud. Because of course, if it's in the cloud, you're not paying for the electricity, or the space, or the cooling, or fixing it, or patching it, or repairing it. That's all being done for you. So good, yeah, good responses. So yeah, cost is, is good, flexible, agile, agile, perhaps more controversially. So for some of the IT staff, there's a report lots long ago that said 80% of your IT budget and your time, perhaps more importantly, is being spent on looking after and running what you already have. Would you agree with that? Is that? Yeah, it's kind of, kind of nods and yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. And only 20% focused on new stuff and, and doing what you're about as an organization, which is teaching and learning. It's patching and servicing and fixing and repairing and, and all that kind of mundane stuff. So wouldn't it be great if we could give you back another 20%, so 40% innovation, 40% focused on what you're about as an organization, teaching and learning maybe 50%, 60% and growing. So rather than doing mundane stuff and all these high tech people, very intelligent, very brainy, costly people, perhaps getting them focused on what we are about as organizations rather than having heads in wires and cables and heads in machines trying to fix them. Uh, we'll do that for you. You focus on the really interesting stuff. So it's also about agility and focus as well as cost. So it's really exciting. So good responses, thank you very much. So that's our, our kind of cloud strategy. This is part of our evolving path, if you like, to the cloud. As I said, we've worked with one, if you look on the extreme left there, on your extreme left, uh, that's where uh, an organization, still coming across small colleges and, and schools where they run one server and one application on each server. And so they've got lots and lots of servers totally underutilized, burning off electricity, and increasing the carbon footprint, space, time, etc. And so the first step there is virtualization, making those servers work harder, running more services than just the one. And a lot of organizations, colleges, universities, uh, moving towards that and have moved towards that very successfully, cut down the number of servers they're looking after, uh, reduce the carbon footprint because of that, electricity, etc. Once I start doing that, then I can move to the next stage, which is infrastructure as a service in the cloud. That's moving those virtual machines I've created, which are running on one machine. I can then start, well, maybe, maybe it's time I could actually push that into a cloud service. Microsoft cloud service, or others are available. Uh, obviously, ours is, good. go for that one, that's why I'm here. So, um, infrastructure as a service provides us with that platform to put these virtual machines in. So, traditional applications, typically think they're running on a server singularly, then they're running multiple, sharing their server with other services, and now they're actually being put into the cloud, but running as they would if they were placed on one server on the premise. So again, reducing costs, footprint, electricity, etc. So that's taking the traditional environment and putting it into the cloud. Then the next level is platform as a service, and this is where 
the applications are cloud aware. And what do I mean by that? It means that the applications can pull in information and apps and from all over the place, from other cloud services, from on-premise services, and provide that information and application and computing power to multiple devices. How many of you have more than one computer? Okay, let's see how far we can go. Two, three, still hands up, four. So when I say computer, I mean any device. So handheld phones, five, six, still going, seven. Okay, that's, you're going too far for me, that's, that's brilliant. So you get the idea. So the applications that are multiple device aware can be spread across these devices, synchronizing up, they're more cloud aware than the new wave of devices and applications uh, and using these services. So platform as a service, is that, and there's a whole load of services in there uh, on top of all of that. And then what we're talking about today is software as a service, which is our Office 365 brand. So our branding for these two areas, we call it Azure, or when we're in the UK, we call it Azure. The Americans call it Azure, Asia, Asia. Um, meaning, anybody know what Azure means? The word Azure. Blue, that's right, blue. It's a, it's a, it's a shade of blue. So blue, blue sky, cloud, okay. Marketing is wasted on some people, I don't know. So Azure is our platform for infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Uh, so that, that's our, our platform. In fact, it's the platform for our software as a service. So underneath our software as a service, which is Office 365, is Azure running. That's our fabric underneath it. And just another picture of that is all well, the lighter colors is what we then look after. So on the left-hand side, if it's on-premise fully, you're looking after every area, every level of those stack, including the electricity and the tin and everything else that goes underneath that. Uh, the more you move to the cloud, the more we look after those services underneath and the more you focus on the interesting stuff, uh, what it's doing for your organization, teaching and learning. Uh, and so that's good. And what we're offering is enterprise cloud services mixed with on-premise stuff. So again, there's this mix of the two together. There's this hierarchical and hybrid mix of on-premise with off-premise services. So from your staff and students' perspective, they may not know they're using a cloud service, whether that's backup, extra storage, extra computing power, um, email, sharing documents, whatever it may be, they may not know and probably won't know that it's actually a cloud service because they're logging into it into their normal environment. They're accessing it as they would access a local service. So it's transparent. And that's our view, and we feel that's our differentiator. They become one in effect in terms of working. Now, talked about the data centers before. These are massive places from our perspective. This is a, a new one that's been opened in America. These are huge. We buy on massive scale and then are able to provide that back in terms of economies of scale to our customers. They are huge and they are. Uh, high-tech, we use the latest in technology, as I said, in terms of cooling and electricity efficiencies, etc., etc., and always looking at that kind of technology and reviewing it. Um, if you look inside, they look, they look kind of boring. Yes, they're big, but they're kind of boring because there's not much. We don't spend much on decoration. We don't spend much on making it look pretty. Uh, these containers, and they are literally specialized custom containers, are full of kit. They are full and racks and racks of machines. And we literally plug these in to the data center like you would plug in a hard drive into a RAID machine. And yeah, we get these pre-built, they arrive, we plug them into the application fabric, as we call it, and they run our systems. It's massive on a huge scale. And so what we're talking about here is utility computing. So we all run electricity, don't we? We all switch on a light and expect electricity to come on. We don't have a generator in our back garden to do that. Or if we turn on the water, we expect clean water to come out. We don't worry about what's going on behind the scenes to make sure that water's clean. We don't have a cleaning plant in our back garden. It's provided by a utility service. And so we're getting to the stage now where we can offer the same sort of thing for computers. For instance, we have a bank that runs up 3,000 machines a night, runs them for five hours, and then drops them again. They didn't have to build a data center because of that. And the savings are huge. 
So they do get the same computing power, get the same processing efficiency at a fraction of the cost compared to what they did. We have a college in the Northeast who, because of the way things are, they had to close down a building which was five miles from the main campus and that just happened to be the, data, the disaster recovery service was built into that secondary room, that secondary building. And so they said, well, what should we do? Do we have to build a new data center? We can't have it on campus because that kind of defeats the object of it being a disaster recovery service. So where do we put it? And so they put the whole lot in Azure. So they're running that in Azure, again at the fraction of a cost. They only need to pay for it when they use it. So all the framework's there, but it's only charged when they use it. As I said before, we're not new to this game. We've had massive services, online services, for a long time across our data centers. We're just extending this and making it more accessible to our customer base. We have data centers across the world. We have two in Europe, Dublin and Amsterdam. And so that brings it within the European Union in terms of data laws, and I'll cover that a little bit later. They are huge centers, as you've seen there. We've invested a lot of money in them. We have them independently verified. And also, from an academic perspective, the services we run for academia are exactly the same services we run for commercial, finance, central government, pharmaceutical, etc. So you can imagine the level of compliance that we have to adhere to to make sure that these systems are being used by these sectors. So typically, far and beyond that, in terms of compliance and data protection law, than any academic site would ever need. But these systems are up at that level. There is no separate container in the corner for academia. The systems are spread across all those systems and the services that we offer. So your service could be shared with finance system or a, um, a central government service. So uh, no concerns there in terms of data protection. Hopefully, talk to me later about that and I'll speak a couple of slides later as well. Um, in terms of academia, we introduced the first free email system for academia specifically in 2003, specifically with domains for the academic sites so they could use their own academic domain names. That was live at Edu and that was introduced in 2003 with a huge 500 megabytes of storage for email. That was groundbreaking. We'll never use all of that. Um, we've kind of moved on from there. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about our software as a service, which is off branded as Office 365. So Office 365 is broken down into three core components. Email, real-time communication, and collaboration. And they are fully integrated. So the three core services are fully integrated. So when you sign up for 365, you sign up for what we call a tenancy. You have your own tenancy. Those systems are pre-configured and pre-integrated. You then customize them and administer them the way you want to. It's as though you're running those systems locally. You had full administration rights, full configuration rights, and customization rights of your tenancy, as we call it. And these are the three core systems. So email, as you would expect, it's enterprise class. There's no cut-down version, as I said, for academia. This is enterprise class email system. Full calendaring, busy search, the latest and the greatest in terms of feature sets. Because it's running in the cloud, you also get the latest versions. So we're running 2013 versions of all these services in the cloud now for our customers. Real-time communication means instant messaging, video, audio. And, and interestingly, something called presence. Anybody heard of presence? Presence. Okay, so presence, what does that mean? It means that if I'm sat in, say I'm, I'm, I'm picking on you again over here. Say I send an email to your good self, or you sent me one, I'm replying. And I see that wherever your name is, whether it's in the email system, the collaboration system, the instant messaging service, wherever your email is, even an author of a document, a little mark next to you, a little box next to my good friend here will tell me if he's immediately available. If it's green, he's immediately available for communication. So maybe I don't send the email, I'll set up an instant message because I know he's immediately available. Maybe I'll start an audio link, maybe an audio and video link and we'll discuss the document. 
Maybe we'll exchange the document, bring it up on screen, and both work on it at the same time. It changes the culture of an organization, this type of technology. Don't get me wrong, it's an interesting cultural change, and sometimes we have lecturers and teachers not so keen on this idea, this whole idea of, you mean people know what I'm doing? And that's sometimes interesting culturally within the organization. However, because these systems are all integrated, it adheres to calendaring. So if I'm a lecturer and I've booked out myself on a class or I'm talking to uh, the, uh, the head teacher and I've booked out my calendar or I'm out on a field trip, then I'm immediately flagged as busy. Those little blocks, wherever my name is, are red. And of course, I have full override over it. And I can even have different statuses depending on different groups. So maybe to my class, I'm available. To everybody else, I'm not. So again, this, this whole idea of presence, which permeates through all the systems, is quite an interesting one. We've got some universities and colleges really excited about it, in that it will change the way communication is made uh, across the college or university. So that's instant, as I say, that's uh, video, audio, instant messaging. And the, the last one is collaboration. So collaboration meaning sharing of documents, um, sharing information, um, blogs, uh, sharing ideas and thoughts, social um, sort of interfaces. So internet type style information. Got workflow built into that, document management built into that, uh, and also personal storage and enterprise storage built into that. And as I say, it's all integrated. So I could build a complete internet service. We have some organizations, some academic organizations, actually building a VLE around this. Um, now, it, this can be as small as you want it or as big as you want it. It's a complete development environment as well and comes with development tools to add to it. So those three core services are Exchange is our email service, Link is our instant messaging video audio service, and SharePoint is our online collaborative service. And the SharePoint element also includes access to the web versions of our Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote applications. So if somebody, or maybe a student, doesn't have access to that in their digs or at home or wherever they are, or maybe they're, they're working remotely for whatever reason, via a browser, they can gain access to those applications and continue working from their shared document space. And that's a cross-device. Remember, if we're going to be no more in the cloud, we've got to work across device. iPads, Android devices, and so on and so forth. Not just Microsoft stuff. It's got to be fully integrated, which it is. So let me just have a quick, because 365, there are three options in terms of storage. I just wanted to cover that because sometimes it's quite confusing. They are not interchangeable. So for our email service, we have 25 gigabytes of email space per individual, staff and students. Hopefully that's enough. There are options if it's not enough. We had one head teacher in a school, had archived everything since email was introduced, including all the files, had more than 25 gigabytes before they started with 365. So we provided a, a way to enable him to have the archiving in the cloud as well, as well as the mailbox locally. Seven gigabytes of personal storage space, again, for staff and students. The seven gigabytes of personal storage space. And SkyDrive Pro. SkyDrive Pro being different from our consumer version of our storage space. So you can, you can sign up to SkyDrive now online directly. That's yours to control and manage. SkyDrive Pro, whilst owned by the individual, is now a managed storage environment within the 365 tenancy. So administrators can recover files if a lecturer leaves administrators can gain access to information, et cetera, as the administrators should be able to do. So it's a managed storage environment. We also provide a 10 gigabyte pool, and for every individual registered to the 365 environment within your tenancy, you get an extra 500 megabytes of storage space. So let me give you an example. Uh, we had one college uh, recently, 10,000 users, including staff, were registered and affiliates. Uh, that gave them five terabytes of storage. Now this storage is interesting. This is the one that you can allocate yourselves to classes, to lecturers, to departments. You decide where the storage goes 
and this is for shared assignments and projects, maybe for clubs. We've got people using it for club space, uh, the chess club, the canoeing club, whatever it may be. You decide where this goes and build on it yourself. Now everything I've told you so far is free for staff and students. There is no charge for this from Microsoft. There's no subscription charges. And because all the, the, um, the environment's in the cloud, there's no, obviously no charges for servers, etc., etc. So this is provided free for academia, uh, for all staff and students, and academic organizations. There's no charge for that. Did I mention that? There's no charge? Okay. There are two basic deployment options for this. Uh, cloud managed, and we do have some of the small organizations where they said, well, look, you know, we don't want full integration. We'll just have it as a separate cloud service. That's the simplest one to set up. You simply sync either via CSV file or for smaller academic organizations. They type in the usernames, and away they go. Configure it, put some rules around the email, and off they go. And it's the easiest to do. It's very simple to use. A bit harder to manage, but simple to get up and running. So cloud-based uh, managed, where the identities are in the cloud and separate from the local environment. Uh, the other one is a hybrid service, where we can mix the two together. So again, talking about this hybrid approach from Microsoft. So we, if somebody logs on locally into your environment, they get single sign-on access to 365 and all the stuff in 365. And vice versa, if you swap out and go into other services. To do that, we need some federated services. So there's some, some architecture which is needed to accomplish that. That's a map. We'll provide you with these slides later uh, to have a look at that. Again, this can be this architecture for federated services can be put in the cloud as well. It doesn't have to run locally. And we actually have some partners who provide this service in the cloud as well to reduce costs even further. So that single sign-on, total integration, seamless integration between on-premise stuff and off-premise stuff. So general benefits to education, well, we've, we've covered them already. Significant savings in terms of not having to buy tin, and of course, super savings because we're not even charging for use of it for staff and students, for academic sites. Uh, accessibility, we've still come across sites where they can't get access to on-premise email, they can't get access to on-premise storage. Because this is a cloud service, it's immediately accessible, should you want it to be anywhere, anytime, any device that's supported, i.e. browser-based devices. Then continuing that theme, easy collaboration, document fidelity. I want to say about that, majority of sites across the world and the cross-sector, most organizations use our productivity tools, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Legally or illegally, there's over 90% of organizations around the world use our stuff. Um, for productivity. If you're using that locally, it makes sense to have the service in the cloud using the same one. Because if I then save documents between the two, I've got that document fidelity uh, between them. And it's familiar tools. People using Microsoft stuff locally, it's familiar. It's that transparent access. The tools in the cloud are very familiar to the tools on premise. So it makes it easy to use. Five minutes. Surely not. OK, privacy matters. We absolutely make a commitment to education. We will not advertise through Office 365 tenancies. We will not make any claims on your data. We will not monitor emails going through our service for profiling or any other reason. We make no claims on your data. If you want it scrubbed, it will be scrubbed. We will not try to use your data for commercial use. Amen. So there's a trust center online uh, we can see all this in terms of our commitments to, to um, your data, and it's your data, and you can take it off if you want it, and we make no claims to it. Um, independently verified, so it's ISO 27001 verified. We cover EU model clauses, um, Patriot Act, etc., etc. It's IL2 accredited, the only cloud service to be so in the UK uh, at a, a central government level, and for other uh, public sector organizations. And also, uh, we had it independently verified by Janet. Or just, as you know, about the same organization as JISC, of course it is. Uh, and so what happened last year, several universities, colleges approached JISC and said, uh, JISC, Janet, kind of mixed up, no, I couldn't do that. So approached Janet and said, 
We would like to review the terms and conditions for Office 365. We get to go through all the data protection issues and all the uh, legal accreditation around compliance, data protection, Patriot Act. We don't want to do that individually. It's too lengthy. We don't want to pay costs to legal companies to do that. We want you to work with Microsoft. And so they did that, spent three months. We went through end to end, uh, negotiated on some changes on behalf of the academic community and have produced something called the Janet Amendments for Office 365. Catchy title, I think. Uh, and so that's on behalf of the academic community. They've done that. They have had it, had it independently verified by a legal company who specialise in data protection law, etc. And so that has been done on your behalf. They've done the due diligence. And that can be seen on their website, etc. So I think that's important uh, to get that kind of. I look after the relationship with Janet. So something we announced last week as well, uh, with Janet, I think you saw, some of you saw, was we've, uh, we now have an alliance agreement with Janet looking at other initiatives around cloud services and as part of that, a direct connection from the Janet network to our data centers. So that will be live as of 1st of August. And that's not just for 365, that's for Azure services, in fact, any service that runs in our data center. Bing, that well-known, wonderful search engine that I know you all use, uh, and other services as well. <coughs> Including, you'd be horrified to know, Xbox. So we have students using Xbox across your Janet network. Well, there we go. So, uh, oops, there's a bit of a hiccup there. So there's a whole load of sites. Make this available to you. Whoops. And close it down. So there's a whole load of sites that you can get uh, all the information from. Next step would be uh, a trial, free trial, 30 days if you want to. Have a play with it. If you want to make it live, just use your academic site to verify it. We don't change anything. That will then will not expire. It will not expire. Um, play with it, have a go, talk to me uh, and, and our specialist partners. We've had academic sites do this themselves. Um, we've got specialist partners who can do it and we also have a deployment specialist in the team who can help and advise and guide on deploying this stuff. So please come and talk to me. I was going to do a demonstration. We're out of time. Sorry about that. Honestly, it does work, really. Uh, but I can share the demonstration if you want it on a one-to-one. -one. Um, but uh, in fact, I had Alan Wood over there, who's our business manager for, the, for Scotland. Put your hand up, Alan. There he is. Uh, covers academia in Scotland and colleges and universities, etc. We were going to do a link together, a link session together. But anyway, we can, we can do that another time. But happy to come and visit sites webinars, etc. cetera, uh, please come and talk to me. But thank you very much for the invitation to come and see you today. It was really good. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll probably just go for one question, perhaps, but oh, yeah. probably best if, uh, Sorry, yeah. if you could, over lunch or something, catch oh, yeah. up with you. Uh, yeah, sure. But if there's a, a question or anything that anybody would like to put to you at the moment, if anyone's up for it, no? Any questions? Question then. Okay. I said a quick question. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. So yeah, yeah. So basic question is, any case studies on universities, colleges, academic sites using Link and other 365 components? Absolutely, yes, we have. And I'll, get, I'll provide them to you and provide the links over yeah, to see how they're using this stuff. Because j just a quick one on that, we have a, a, a site called Partners in Learning. Partners in Learning site is as a hub owned by Microsoft, but run by lecturers and, and teachers around the world. So over 4 million lecturers and teachers on it. They share best practice and how they use this stuff in the classroom. And there's lots of exciting examples on how they use this stuff. So yeah, I'll put you to that as well. Thank you. One more? Or? I think we're we'll That's it. Time out. Come and speak to me. To so we'll talk to you over lunch, etc. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much.